What is good, everybody? Welcome to another Gold Standard Podcast. I'm Rob Stats Carrera here with the human wet blanket, Levin Black. What's up, Levin? I had to go with human wet blanket. Starting us off with a bang, huh? Yep. Couldn't That's resist. how the show's going to be? You get an interview with Patrick Willis and you think, well, now I can insult my co-host right at the start. I mean, <laughs> one side's Levin Black, one side's Patrick Willis. So the scale is not exactly balanced. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's probably not uh, incorrect on this this uh, episode. So we Definitely will have... going to be a lot of Rob stats on this episode. So sorry for those of you out there that don't like old people voice. <sighs> it's a fat voice, first of all. Get it right. Uh, no, <laughs> oh, we will... that's right. I was I was the old person. You were the fat one. Well, first time and that's it, ever. It's happened the other way me. around. I'm fat, and you're like six months older. <laughs> We will have Patrick Willis on this episode. Uh, he was very gra gracious with his time, gave us about 15 minutes, so we'll play that for you as well. We want to remind you, please, first of all, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at stats on fire. Also, subscribe to the Gold Standard Podcast Network. And if you're subscribed to the Niners Nation Podcast Network, just stay there. We're getting all that worked out. Don't go anywhere. I promise you, hopefully by March, that should be all worked out. But just for now, stick with us we always say if you leave a review on the show we will read it so i've got this one five stars best all caps 49ers podcast from cdifr rob is a star man he tells it like it is in his mind and he sticks by his opinions he's a fan and i respect the heck out of his thoughts and passion and consistent and i swear that's not my burner no it's just your wife's <laughs> I can either he confirm nor deny. He sees it in his mind and he sticks to it. That's that's an interesting way to put it. Do you see it in your mind when you're speaking? I just so most of the time I just kind of black out and words come yeah, out of my head. That's how I am. Like, I, yeah, the whole episode's kind of a blur, and then after the episode, I start going back and I'm like, oh yeah, like if I listen to our podcast uh, after it comes out, I'll be like, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah i remember that now yep okay i remember that now you know it's like watching a movie that you haven't seen in five years that you only saw once it's like as the scene starts five seconds into it you re then remember that whole scene but prior to that scene you can't remember this is what we do here on the gold standard podcast oh, yes. network hard hitting um, stuff there is there are some weeks of the off season where like nothing is going on and even though the Niners season is over this is a week where a lot is going on because it's super weak the week before the Super Bowl, everybody's at Arizona and there's players from all sorts of teams doing all sorts of interviews. And not surprisingly, the Niners are heavily featured in that because the team has been so successful and they have a lot of interesting personalities. And they've been saying some things that probably get Eagles fans upset. They've been chiming in about the quarterback situation. Trey Lance has been doing some media, which you and I found very interesting as we listened to that before we hit record on this episode. So we're going to get to that. Obviously, we'll have the interview with Patrick Willis, and then we'll get to uh, some of the Steve Wilkes stuff as well, because I know you haven't given your reaction to that yet, Levin. Let's start with what some of the 49ers are saying. Um I want to get to the Trey Lance stuff first because I found it fascinating. He was on with Rich Eisen, and you and I listened to a portion of the interview, and two things jumped out to me. One is what you said, which is just from a maturity slash mental standpoint, Trey Lance is off the charts, and we can get to that. But the bigger thing that stood out to me is like his personality is starting to show a little bit. He said, like, we're going to win a Super Bowl. He talked with Christian McCaffrey about it. Like, he's starting to, to me, kind of, in, at least in his own mind, take ownership of the job, which I feel like he needed to do. <laughs> well, ding dong, the incumbent's gone. <laughs> to put it that way. Uh, yeah, Jimmy's gone. There's a void. He's able to step in. Like, Brock, you could say, kind of took over the locker room, but he's not that established. You know, he's not the clear cut. Oh, this is the guy we're 100% behind this guy we're going to war with, you know, and he's out injured. So that helps too. There's a void that Trey Lance is able to step into and kind of say, Hey, this is mine. And I don't think he was able to do that with Jimmy around. He, you can't come in and uh, walk up to the pack of wolves and piss and say, hey, this territory is mine and expect it to go well. You know what I mean? Like Jimmy was the leader. Trey Lance wasn't able to come in and mark his territory. 
and he said that he expects a quarterback competition and he right. welcomes the quarterback competition. And that's the other thing I like too. Well, he, he didn't quite say he said he welcomes it. He said, but he also said, I just hope to have like a shot at winning the job. And I thought that was interesting that he hopes to have a shot, which means I think he knows to a certain degree that it's not like a fair fight right now. That if Brock Purdy gets healthy prior to the season with enough time to like play in some preseason games, it doesn't matter what Trey Lance does. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's what Trey is. He's worried about that possibility. And he's bas- that's what I took that as, is he says, I hope to have a chance to earn the spot. That's kind of what Tim Kawakami and others have intimated in the, I mean, Kawakami basically said it in his last mailbag column that the job is 90% Brock Purdy's there and 10% okay. what Trey Lance does. You mention it and there's multiple people saying that. Where the F is that coming from? Because the front office doesn't leak. Well, I know that like, well, this team leaks when it wants to leak. Yes, but who is it coming from? Because I feel like it's coming from a specific player. I don't know for sure which one it is, but it just seems like some player is telling people behind the scenes, like, that's the guy that I want. Oh, and I, I think that is different him. than how it's being reported. Because maybe Kyle Shanahan is dead on set that, hey, Brock's healthy, it's his team. And that may be true, but... I seriously doubt Kyle has told that to anybody. So a player saying that to a reporter and you turning that and saying, well, this is Brock Purdy's team if he's healthy is BS because it's one player's opinion. Well, yeah, we don't know where that came from. Um, But the thing that I like to see from Trey is that he was like, he was confident. He said he welcomes the quarterback competition, which you should be confident. You were picked third in the draft, and Brock Purdy was picked last in the draft. <laughs> Two different drafts, but nonetheless. Um, but I like that he, Trey showed a little confidence. You know, I feel like he came into the league and he was a rookie, and he just wanted to keep his head down and do things the right way and not, you know, make any waves. Now I think I almost sense a little urgency from him. Like he realizes this is his last shot, and he's going to be confident and he's going to go out there and take it. I think he's showing more of what others see on the practice field because we've heard from some players that Trey Lance is like cocky almost on the field. You know, he smack talks and we actually just saw Jimmy Ward in one of his uh, Instagram lives uh, from this past week. He was talking about that Trey Lance annoys him in practice because, you know, you're not supposed to move out of the pocket and there'll be times when he's, you know, in a real game. Oh, he's sacked. But instead, Trey Lance just keeps the play alive and keeps moving because you can't actually sack the quarterback in practice. And then after a bunch of seconds, he finds somebody open and gets a play, and then he's smack talking. You know, Jimmy Ward said that that annoys him because it's like, I think he said, you've already been sacked twice on the play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he was like, screw that guy, Trey Lance, but he was saying it annoys him that like Trey Lance is kind of almost breaking the rules that not only is he like, nah, you can't really sack me. Ha ha. But then when he does get a big play on it, he's like, take that. So I think he's always had this kind of swagger, this confidence, this uh, persona. And now he's showing it to the media because in a lot of ways, he does have to fight a public perception battle. Oh, hundred percent. And he didn't shy away. Uh, Eisen said, you know, like you literally haven't played. And he's, he says, yeah, I know. I get it. But he was, you know, throwing shade at Fred Warner, saying Fred's not going to show up for the first part of OTAs because he doesn't want the smoke. Like, yeah. that's good. And and he crashed. Yeah. Uh, Christian McCaffrey was on with Pro Football Talk, and, and Lance crashed the interview. Like, I feel like you don't do that unless you're comfortable around these people. And I feel like yeah. there's a comfort there that I'm seeing with him that I don't know that I saw earlier. I thought it was interesting that he said he talked to Christian on the plane. And... Uh, Rich Eisen said, who? And he said, Christian McCaffrey, we're close. Like Christian McCaffrey just came to the team. So if he's close with Christian McCaffrey, I mean, Christian McCaffrey is one of the best players on the offense. So I thought that was interesting because it's one of two things. Either he really is close and kind of hit it off with Christian McCaffrey, which would be amazing because he wasn't playing at the time. Uh, You know, he hasn't gotten to play with Christian McCaffrey, so it's kind of hard to create that closeness. Or... He's saying that to try to like inject himself, in which case I think that probably backfires because Christian McCaffrey and the rest of the team knows 
whether or not that's true. And if he's sitting here trying to play it up to the meat, but I don't think he would. Right. I'm just saying like, that is the other possibility, but I do, I do think it's really interesting that he was like, yeah, we're close. And then we were talking on the plane. Well, that's like the guy of the offense. He's the one that makes it go now. So that that's kind of interesting. The other interesting thing about any of this is Brock Purdy hasn't had surgery yet. Levin, like everyone keeps talking about, oh, three months, six months. It's like, yeah, well, that clock doesn't start until he actually has the procedure. And I know that they were finalizing it and everything. But, you know, every day that goes by, I'm I'm worried at this point, you lose another week. So even if he and we don't know, he might need the full Tommy John ligament replacement surgery. But even if he doesn't at this point, you're talking about not really being able to get back until very, very late the end of training camp. Trey may get a start just by default because there's nobody else there. Yeah, it's uh, I think we've hit the point where it's concerning because the longer it goes, it's not just that it pushes back the timetable. It's a bad sign, in my opinion. The longer it goes means to me that maybe there's not as much uh, unanimous opinion that he only needs the uh repair rather than the complete reconstruction uh and thus he's trying to find like what is the real answer here mm-hmm. uh or just that his swelling hasn't gone down he can't get the surgery until the swelling goes down and if the swelling's not going down this late into the the ball game i mean we're we're at what 10 days 11 days then i think that's concerning too cuz it should have gone down by now people have had the surgery by this point of the injury so Either way you look at it, the longer it goes, the longer it delays, I think it doesn't 100% mean, oh, this is bad, but it makes me more and more concerned with every passing day. Well, it changes the timing of everything, and it it alters the 49ers' plans because they want to know, do we have to find one quarterback or two? You know, if Brock's going to be out for the first part of the season, that's somebody else that they have to account for with the salary cap and all that stuff. And look, you know, I'll just say it like we saw with Jimmy Garoppolo, right? If you wait to have the surgery, it changes your timeline for everything. And so Mm -hmm. that may be happening with Brock Purdy. We don't know, but it was cool for me to see Trey Lance out there just confident. I just, every time he talks, Levin, I just, I like the kid. I like his personality. I just like him. And I really hope that he gets a chance to go out there and compete. And I hope he just goes out there and lets it rip, right? Don't worry about anything. Just just go and let your abilities out, and hopefully that'll be enough. I got a mantra for this offseason. It is give Lance a chance. <laughs> I'm going to keep repeating it because that's all I want. Like, hey, if he comes out and he's not clearly better than Brock, go with Brock. I'm not anti-Brock. But I do think Trey Lance should have a chance at the starting gig. You know what I mean? I don't think Brock's seven, eight games is – Something where, oh, somebody looked really good for half a season, so nobody else has any chance of earning the starting gig. I don't care. No, I, it's not a large enough sample size to say that. I think it should be a true competition and, you know, let the best quarterback win. And whoever doesn't win, it means you got a really good backup. And let's be honest, given the way the 49ers quarterback injury history has rolled, they'll probably both get a chance <laughs> but, to play next season uh, regardless. Uh, but I do agree with you. Give Lance a chance. I'm down for that. Um, and we'll see. Hopefully it uh, plays out. You know, I think that just from a football standpoint, the Niners almost have to protect themselves by, I think everything they do this off season should be to support the development of Trey Lance, just because he's more than likely going to be the quarterback that's healthy enough to go week one. And he needs the reps. He needs the support. He needs all of it, man. So they should be all in on the Lance business. And hopefully they are. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a choice and I don't, you know, the more I thought about it, I don't think they're going to be able to get a big name second quarterback or third quarterback, depending on how you look at it. You know, I don't think they're going to go and get a free agent that's going to be able to come in and be like this really experienced vet. Because here's the thing, like for them to sign an experienced vet, you know, an Andy Dalton, Joe Flacco, even a Matt Ryan, they have to be willing to be third string. Right. Because that that's the reality. The reality is those players want to be one play from having a chance to prove themselves again. 
And I don't see them accepting a third string situation, which is what it's going to be unless Brock Purdy needs the complete reconstruction. Cause at that point he's out all season. So I think that they're not going to be able to go out and get an Andy Dalton or a super experienced veteran because they're not going to be willing to take that third string gig. And that means that they're going to be looking more. I think they want somebody that has experience. I don't think they're going to draft somebody and go with another rookie or anything like that. They already caught their lightning in a bottle with Brock Purdy. I think they'll go out and they'll get somebody like a Kyle Allen, maybe, you know, somebody that started seven, eight games, but is clearly a backup in this league and is willing probably to take the contract. I don't, yeah. I don't see the big name. And so that think, means it's all Trey Lance. It's not going to be a, well, Trey Lance, you kind of have an opportunity here, but we're also going to give Andy Dalton half the snaps. And that would be the worst thing they could do. They <laughs> need to be all in on land, not, not as a dig on Dalton. Like they, they need to give right. him all the reps, all of them, every single one. He should be staying after practice, taking reps. You know, the past two off seasons, I've had the chance to interview Trey. And I was thinking, Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to do it this year. But if I did, the first thing I was I would have asked him is, are you doing the like virtual reality headset thing every day? Because he just needs the reps. At least he could get like mental reps that way. If I were him, I would have that thing on eight hours a day, just be cranking out the snap just to do something. Well, I think that was the most uh, intriguing. The thing that excited me the most in what Trey Lance said in the interviews here for Super Bowl week with Rich Eisen it's that after he got back, and especially after Brock took over, he felt like he just has to do something to help. And so he went to Kyle and said, what can I do? And Kyle let him start kind of trying to break down film and, and things like that. And I think that's really encouraging because if you can see the game, like the coach wants you to see the game, if you can break down film in the same way that your coach would see it and break down the film, that's a huge plus. And that's sort of the big thing with Brock is that he sees the game the way Kyle wants him to see the game. That seems to be why Kyle enjoys him so much. Uh, so we'll see if Trey can can adapt or evolve or whatever and, and see the game ultimately the way Kyle wants him to see it. That is what is going to be so exciting for me. Like, I want to unwrap this damn Christmas present and we haven't been able to do it yet. So hopefully we will. Other 49ers are talking a lot of conversation about the NFC championship game. And I think they feel exactly the way we fell, Levin, after the in the instant reaction show. We said it. It felt like the chance to win was stolen from the 49ers. And I think it was Christian McCaffrey or Debo. One of them said that exact phrase that it was mm -hmm. stolen. And, you know, Eagles fans are going to get all salty about that. But I don't know how you expect 49ers to, players to feel any other way about it. I mean, they ran out of quarterbacks. Look, Eagle fans at this point should just shut the heck up. I mean, it's not surprising that a team that literally tried to play with no quarterback whatsoever <laughs> feels like they didn't have a chance to win. Right. Like, they're not saying that, oh, screw the Eagles, they shouldn't be in the Super Bowl. They're saying we didn't get a chance to prove, and we think that if we had had our starting quarterback, we would have won. What the freak do you expect them to say? Like, we're, we're talking about professional here at any level. Any level, a team always believes that if everything is fair and no injuries, they're the better team. Like that shouldn't be groundbreaking. You shouldn't be shocked that a team that has won as much as the 49ers has won in the last four years thinks that, hey, if we had a quarterback whatsoever, we would have won the game. Like you shouldn't be upset about that. You shouldn't care. Right. That's the part that bugs me. You should not care. That another team thinks that if all things were equal and the quarterback stayed healthy, they would have won. What do you care? You're in the Super Bowl. You won the game. Move on. Go mess with the Kansas City Chiefs fans. You know, go throw eggs at them and be the trashiest, worst fan base <laughs> with another team. Like, I don't understand why they're constantly looking back like, oh, the 49ers. Like, you're in the Super Bowl. What, what are you looking back for? Yeah, I mean, I'm still getting comments on an Instagram video I posted the Monday after the game of Brock's injury. You know, my and my point was basically like, look, Brandon Ayuk's coming wide open. What if he had gotten this pass off? And I'm still getting Eagles fans yelling at me like, dude, stop it. Like, you're about to play the biggest game of, of the entire season. Who cares if 49er fans think that we were cheated out of, you know, a chance to win the Super Bowl? Like, it, like you said, it does not matter. 
but yet a lot of people are going to respond to Debo and Christian McCaffrey saying that and and I guess be mad at him. But I, I almost think that it helps them this year because like we said afterwards, it wasn't as painful as it would have been if we just lost because it wasn't like we like the Eagles beat the 49ers like we didn't get a chance to win and it just it just didn't happen it wasn't in the cards and I feel like some of the players feel that way too they are not internalizing this loss in the same way that they would have if the Eagles just played a better a better game you know I think it's a lot more uh, motivating with the way they lost that screw this we we got a bad rap we're going to come back next year and prove what we're saying right now which I mean, every year is different, so I don't really get into that. But I think it's a very motivating. Whereas if you just get beat, yeah, it's motivating. But it's a different type of motivation where in the back of your mind, you're still thinking, yeah, they beat us. You know, whereas right now, I think they can go into next season saying. If any quarterback on our roster stays healthy, we're winning this thing. (laughs) That's true. I mean, at that point, you would think that that would be their mentality. Uh, You know, this is something I brought up with Michelle last week. If the Eagles win the Super Bowl, the Niners may open the year next year in Philadelphia because the Niners have to play in Philly. And if the Eagles win the Super Bowl, they love to have a marquee matchup on that opener. Can you imagine what it would be like Niners Eagles in Philly week one next year with the Eagles raising the championship banner? That would be a hell of a way to start the season. And I got to be honest, I don't know if I I don't know if I love that idea. I got to be honest, uh, if that happens, I might have to tell the wife, hey, you know that fall kind of vacation you were wanting to take? I think we're going to Philly. Uh, (laughs) And and I might guilt trip your butt and tell you, hey, Connecticut's not that far. Get your butt into Philly. In fact, I have my one of my best friends in the whole world. Yeah, get get on the train, man. One of my best friends in the whole world lives in Philly. Two and a half for you. So there you go. If I make it, you better be making it. There you go. All right. We'll see if we can swing that. But uh, yeah, so I wasn't surprised to see the Niners players talk about that. I did think it was interesting to see Debo Samuel was asked about Jimmy Garoppolo on first take. And what he said was sometimes it's just time to move on from a player, Mm -hmm. which is interesting because that is not the tenor of comments about Jimmy Garoppolo we've heard from this locker room in the past he's always been everyone's number one fan they love Jimmy Garoppolo he's beloved in the locker room they all got his back blah 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 all of a sudden now we heard on Twitter Ryan was it Ryan Hensley I think started it that maybe Jimmy was potentially in a spot where he could have been the emergency quarterback for the championship game he decided to shut it down and that Kyle Shanahan didn't like that. John Lynch didn't like that. It kind of created a rift and soured the relationship. Everybody jumped on Ryan. Oh, you don't have any sources. You're an idiot. You're terrible. 49ers Twitter. And then lo and behold, Tim Kawakami comes out and says the same thing, that the relationship soured at some point before the NFC Championship game. Now we're hearing Mm -hmm. it from a bunch of places. And now we're hearing comments like that from Debo Samuel Levin. What do you take away from all this? Look, so I I heard that even before uh, TK came out and kind of confirmed it, I I was thinking to myself, okay, how could this be true? Like I, I heard you, I think it was on uh, with Steph earlier this week where you, you said, well, if Jimmy was refusing to play, why was Kyle talking about him coming back? You know, and that, I didn't that was, say that. I thought you did. Um, somebody, somebody I listened to was talking about how if, if it was, Kyle wants him to play and he refused to play. Why was Kyle literally the week of that game saying, well, we certainly hope he could be back for the Super Bowl if he's refusing to play. So I was trying to think of a way that that's true. And this could actually have happened. And what I came to is I I think I'm not saying this with any kind of sources, but one scenario that does check every box, everybody can be true on this is that Jimmy wasn't fully healthy Jimmy was capable of playing, but it's almost like the T.O. situation in that Super Bowl with the Eagles, where if he plays, he's risking re-injury. It's a lot higher risk of a re-injury, but he could have played. And Kyle Shanahan didn't want him to be the backup, but he said, hey, we will. We want you to be active just in case, because this is our best shot at a Super Bowl. I don't want it to go to waste because of something dumb. 
like qu quarterback injuries, I will activate all three quarterbacks just to make sure we have a quarterback, which I don't think is out of the question. He hasn't had three active before, but he also hasn't had Josh Johnson as his backup before. Uh, and he went to Jimmy and said, I want you to be third string. We do not want to play you whatsoever. We don't plan to play you, but just in case something happens to the first two guys, we don't want to waste a Super Bowl shot here. Are you willing to be active? And he said, no, I'm not risking re-injury. And in that scenario, I don't blame either person. Agreed. Jimmy should absolutely say, heck no, yep. I'm not going in and risking everything going to crap for me because he's projected to get 30 million this offseason, which I don't necessarily through that. That's what uh, sport track is. Or he's spot track make, is. Yeah, he's I, I think he'll get 25 to 30. I, I think he'll have a little bit change. more of an insane. Yeah, I think he'll have a little bit more in incentive laden deal. But if he got re injured, he's looking at one of those one year, $10 million deals where eh, maybe you get a shot and the next offseason you can hit the market and see if you can find a starting gig. So I don't blame him, but I also don't blame Kyle for saying, hey, I want you to be the emergency quarterback. And Jimmy saying no. And then the game going the way it did, Kyle then being <laughs> pissed in retrospect yep. and saying in the being so cold in, in that press conference with john lynch where he said there's no way he comes back because that i feel like that probably would burn the bridge to kyle like because kyle would feel like you just cost me a super bowl but at the same time you can't blame jimmy if that's what happened so i, I think that kind of fits everything i think everybody can be right there and i think it got a little bit more uh credence because chase senior uh who's on twitter you can go follow him he's at the super bowl and he asked jake laser what he thinks of these reports and Jay Glazer says he he didn't he doesn't know anything for sure, but he does wonder if maybe Kyle wanted him to be the emergency quarterback and he was not willing. Something I'm paraphrasing here, but something along those lines. He literally used the emergency quarterback line. But I feel like there's a decent chance that that's what it was, and it, nobody's wrong in that situation. I completely agree with everything you said. I understand it. Whoa. whoa. There's our intro. Put that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. If Jimmy Garoppolo didn't want to put that at risk. Cause here's the other thing too. Like Kyle can sit there and say, Oh, well, we're only going to play you if Josh Johnson gets hurt, but let's say that Brock goes down and Josh is in there and it's like mm -hmm. the second quarter and the offense is just dead. Right. They're not at moving at all. Yeah. yeah. Kyle could go to Jimmy and be like, look, we need you. And Jimmy could be, you know, that puts Jimmy in a really tough spot, you know? So I could see why he would want to just say, no, make me inactive. You know, he's got to mm -hmm. protect that. He's only going to play in this league for so long. He's only going to have the chance to make those kind yeah. of millions of dollars for so long. I do not blame Jimmy. Just like I said last year, there was no bad guy when Jimmy delayed the surgery. He had to do what was best for him. And Jimmy probably has to feel like, hey, I played through injury last year and it screwed me. I'm not doing it again. Yeah. So I feel like Jimmy's stance from the start of this injury was probably, I will return if I'm completely 100%. But if I'm 95%, I'm inactive. I'm not playing. And I, I don't blame him for that. He already destroyed the chance to get one big contract playing through injury for the 49ers. Like You can't expect him to keep coming back when you keep trying to replace him every year, too. I think you're right. And we'll, he'll, we'll see what contract he gets. But I just think it's funny that, you know, this came out on Twitter and everybody was like, oh, unconfirmed rumor. You're an idiot. How could you even put this out here? And then lo and behold, all of a sudden it went from unconfirmed rumor on Twitter to Jay Glazer getting asked about it, to Tim Kawakami reporting about it. Like people have. Can, can I just say the the field has changed. The game has changed. Five years ago, even 10 years ago, for sure. Nobody had sources unless they were somebody that did it full time or in the building every day, developing those sources A Jay yep. Glazer, Ian Rappaport, you know, Adam Schefter, those guys. In today's world, you got guys, Javi Vega, he has sources. You know what? He has some credible sources. Ryan Hinsley, he might have somebody in that locker room that he knows in a different way that he met somehow and they text him. Like it's changed. Uh, somebody that has a thousand followers on Twitter might have a very credible source in today's world. It is too easy to get a hold of somebody and send send info through DMs or text messages and things like that, or even and like I a Snapchat where it disappears so that the person can't try to utilize it. You know, right? And by the way, 
that also means not everybody with a source is now an insider and is 100% right about everything. Some people do lie. That's the problem. That's why Some people you lie. don't know if sources, you can trust. Yeah, sources manipulate people inside the media oh, yeah. and outside the media to get narratives out there. So you still have to evaluate everything on a case-by-case basis. But the idea that at this point you could just blankly rule something out just because it doesn't come from a Schefter or an Ian Rappaport or a Matt Mayoko is absurd. And it's silly, and I hope that people just, you know, see this story and just realize that for the time being. And hopefully we can, you know, have a little patience and and not jump down somebody's throat when they don't necessarily deserve well, it. I'll, I'll say this. If Jimmy Flat refused, like say Jimmy was 100% healthy and just said, no, I'm not playing, I'm not risking it, and that's what the truth is, we'll know sometime in the next five to ten years. Some <laughs> player will be retired and yep. go on a podcast, <clears throat> Martellus Bennett, and right. ridicule him for it because it's not the first time Jimmy's done it. That's the whole point is Martellus Bennett outed Jimmy here. What was that last year? And so and, did Julian Edelman. Yeah, I forget the name he used that, you know, that I came. It wasn't uh, POS. Or no, prick it was a, a I, he, it was he, a he said, Yeah, there you go. Uh, so he said that about Jimmy and that he refused to play the year that uh, or the year that Brady was out on suspension due to the deflate gate. And Jimmy was like, hey. I'm not risking a major sh- shoulder injury. I'm not playing through this injury at the last minute. And Jacoby Brissett had to go in. Right. And he was hated by that team because of that. That's why I gave this rumor credence because I had heard one. I heard that about the Patriots Two, I had heard in 2020 that it was sort of the same thing that he could have come back, but he didn't want to risk it. And then it popped up again. So, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. When this comes up three different times, and one of which we know 100% for sure did happen because players yeah. are on the record talking about it. Yeah, I, I gave that rumor a little more credence than I would just a regular run-of-the-mill Twitter rumor. Okay, let's stop flapping our gums for a second, and we'll get to Patrick Willis because he's a lot more important than you and me. I had a chance to sit down with what? him on Wednesday. Yes, I know. Hard for you to believe. Here's my conversation. I'm a seven-time All-Pro on this show. What are you talking about? <laughs> we are very pleased and privileged to be privileged, excuse me, to be joined by seven-time Pro Bowler, five-time first-team All-Pro, Patrick Willis. Patrick, thanks for a few minutes. Uh, Rod, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You are here on behalf of the NFL Alumni Association and the Huddle Up campaign. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but first, I'm seeing everywhere on Twitter – 49ers players talking about the NFC championship game. Have you ever seen a game where a team ran out of quarterbacks? Uh, I have not. (laughs) That was the, that was the first time. I mean, all year long, they've had unfortunate luck at the quarterback position. And then to get to that game um, after doing so much and getting to that game um, and then to lose, you know, the, the quarterback as they did, and then to lose the, the backup, and then almost be going in with the with the running back. I mean, that was pretty pretty intense. You couldn't imagine that. <laughs> I mean, as a linebacker, you see the running back under center. That's got to be a good feeling for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a linebacker, yeah, that would be. You know, he ain't throwing the ball too much. Uh, <laughs> so you know, you know where to key in at. So. I'm still not over it, but uh, we try to move on. The big question for the Niners is, of course, mm-hmm. Trey Lance, Brock Purdy. You know Matt Mayoko, obviously. Matt covered the team forever. He covered the team while you was there, while you were there. Mayoko said there's going to be a lot of ticked off people in the 49ers locker room if Brock Purdy is not the starter. How big a deal is that if Kyle Shanahan were to go with Trey Lance? Is that a, a big issue if the locker room is not behind him? You know, uh, man, that's a that's a that's a almost a double fold uh, question. In the sense that, um, you know, I feel like those guys are professionals um, and you understand that it's not always about, you know, who's the most liked, you know, it's about, um, you know, what's what that is. It's about the cards that play. Right. And, and I and I kind of thought about this as well, because the easy thing, the larger thing would be like Brock has to be the guy. And most definitely he played tremendously, tremendously well. However, with that being said, there was this thing that I think Jameis Winston said, a quarterback never is supposed to lose his starting job um, to an injury. And so with that being said, um, I think it's only fair that they have 
the the competition in this in that in that sense. Um, but I almost feel like Trey is has that that number one being that he was their first round draft pick. Um, and it's just just the way it is sometimes. Like and so with that being said, you know, you give him opportunity to go play and he doesn't, you know, fulfill that, then you know you have a, a guy that's just it's, you know, licking the chunks to, <laughs> you know, to go, you know, take what he feels is right. Is so, you know, it's it's it's, it's tough. And really, all that matters is whoever they start wins, right? I mean, you guys in 2012, everybody liked Alex Smith in the locker room. He got hurt. Colin came in. Colin won. I mean, his 10th career start was the Super Bowl. As long as the guy that's coming in wins all that stuff kind of doesn't really matter in terms of who the locker room likes more. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate goal is to win and whoever's on the quarterback and they give me the best chance to do that. Then that's who you, you go with. And again, it's, it's unfortunate because you heard, you heard about the injury that, um, that brought, well, the injury that he suffered during the NFC championship game, um, with that being said, it only gives Trey, you know, that much more time to get himself back. And like I said, when the time goes, it's nothing like having healthy competition. With that being said, I think you don't you don't play you don't run the game or run the risk at playing mentally with with Trey's mind in the sense that like you did all you did to get him as a number one. You gotta at least be faithful and allow him to have that opportunity to 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 pretty much, you know, not solidified. So, um, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's just about getting the W's. So. Uh, Niners are hoping that Steve Wilkes could help them get some W's. He's going to be their new defensive coordinator. I looked this up this morning. I couldn't believe it. You only played for two defensive coordinators in your entire career. You had Greg Minuski when you started, and then you had Vic Fangio. How big of a deal is it when a team switches defensive coordinators if they're not going to run the same scheme? Yeah, I mean, that, that can be a little challenging um, depending on, like I said, depending, I mean, terminology is always always runs different uh, within each scheme. But uh, depending on, you know, if it's a 3-4 or 4-3, but I think they, I wouldn't imagine they would go get a 3-4 guy with them having the, the bases that they have with the 4-3. So yeah, I Wilkes think, is, is a 4-3 guy. All right, that's what I was thinking. I, I know down in uh, those guys played really well uh, defensively down in Carolina. So shout out to D'Amico Rons and everything he, he done in his time um, at uh, the 49ers, and all the best to him as he go, you know, be the head coach at the Texans. And I'm looking forward to 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 Steve though, um, just turning up because he got some good players. He got he got some good defensive players. I know they're gonna add some, and so uh, yeah, really looking forward to seeing how they get together it's going to take a little bit of work but um but yeah they got some some veteran guys on the defensive side of the ball which makes it a lot easier as well so the biggest difference i see between the two and I, i'm just sort of diving into this is that D'Amico played a lot of two high safeties and steve wilkes played a lot of one high safety what mm -hmm. is the difference in the defense two high versus one high safety yeah yeah, I guess I guess it would it would kind of depends. Um, a lot of times, running the two high safeties means you're just giving your cornerbacks help. Um, a lot of times, it's kind of kind of saying that you know we may not have. I'm not gonna say you don't have the best corners, but a lot of times you 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 might have some heck. I mean, receivers these days are really well. They play really really good football. I mean, they always have, but these guys are <laughs> something else. And so I say that to say. Um, especially with the rules and stuff being as it is, you can't really just hammer off somebody. I said they make them run a lot easier. But with that being said, running the two high safety allows you to have a help over the top of your cornerbacks. And then when you're doing a single high, a lot of times you are you are saying that you have one and or two pretty good corners that can play top shoulder and lock some guys down, and you can keep that one safety high. Uh, with that, with the two high safeties, you run the risk of, you know, being ran on a lot because you sometimes you have to you want to bring the other safety down in the box. But if you know how to play it right, you can be uh, effective running a two two man high, uh, seven man box or a six man box. Yeah, so. so if you have the one high safety and the other safety is kind of in the box, 
I assume hopefully that that would be Hufanga because to me that seems like where he is best. What is what is his responsibilities in that kind of scheme generally? Um, yeah, Hufanga, I, I, he reminded me of I, I know I'm, as I'm looking at it, um, they did have two safety. I guess he was the the free safety, and because Jimmy, I was trying to look. Jimmy was like the nickelback. Yes, I believe it was. Jimmy used to be the free safety, so I was. No, I haven't had nothing to stop because they had another they had another safety back there, which was a strong safety. Yeah, with that being said, I, I see who who he's really instinctive. And so, you know, you want him to be able to I feel like they can use him anywhere as a free safety, as an extra safety in the box. And I think that's what makes him very, uh very unique. But again, um he has that, you know, that that Palomalu uh Bob to him or whatnot to where you know he's down on the line one second and next you know he's back in the middle half of the field or he's back in the middle half of the field and next you know he's he's blitzing off the edge you know so uh he can do it all um again they have some very good defensive players which always makes it a little bit uh smoother for the defensive coordinator so yeah it's pretty good to take over a job where you have a first team all pro at every level right you got bosa <laughs> warner and hufanga yeah yeah and there's some and 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 there's some hard some hard uh, some hard seconds uh, right behind those guys because I, I still feel like Dre uh, man he's right there with you know he just I think he's he may not be getting the love that he deserves accolade wise but man for me watching him I mean he does everything uh, extremely well I mean he 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 gonna get you some penalties but I think that's just his forte. <laughs> He kind of reminds me of like Draymond. He's just he's that guy that sets that sets that tone in that in that way. And you you need those you need those guys um, like that. So yeah, I, I enjoy watching the whole defense. You're here on behalf of the NFL Alumni Association and the Huddle Up. Let's talk obesity campaign. Tell us what you have going on with them. Yeah, just um, here to, to shed light on uh, obesity that you know that tends to follow us uh, as athletes when we finish playing the game for for, for multitude of reasons. And with the Huddle Up, uh, Let's Talk Obesity campaign, it's just about bringing awareness and not just bringing awareness, but also letting guys know that there is um, help out there. And and, um, and all you have to do is just, you know, call or, or go to the website or and you can get the help to get you back on the track that you want to get on. Website is huddleupobesity.org. I was surprised to see that more than half of former NFL players are dealing with that. You know, I think of all you guys as just constantly training all the time, but obviously that changes once you step away from the game. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when, we, when we're at when we're in the game, is again, it's it's work, it's it's uh, it's your job, it's your way of life, and and now you know I, I can attest, you know, being retired now, going on eight years. Uh, having that, having I know, right? Time is just flown by. Uh, having that, having that, having that structure of that lifestyle, you know, it really does well for your body. And then when you finish, and you may not have that structure, uh, that that discipline. And, and I'm not saying you have to be everything you was when you was playing, but you know, it's really easy to kind of you know let yourself you know get out of shape. And, and once you got out of shape, it's like it's really easy. Just the other things start falling apart. And so I'm just an advocate of you know, trying to trying to stay not trying, but staying active in some form or fashion, whether it's stretching, walking, uh, just just moving. Uh, the body is made to move, and so again, this campaign is 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 um, every bit about just again just bringing awareness and also letting guys know that you know there's help and um, that we can do something about it. The website again is huddleupobesity.org. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You went back to Levi's this year for the alumni Niners alumni celebration, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. Who was the first person you talked to when you went back to Levi's? Uh, so <laughs> it's interesting. That weekend was a special weekend altogether. Um, I actually, they had, so it was a whole weekend, but two days of that weekend, I actually flew down to Baton Rouge, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, Eric Reed and I collaborated with. Uh, I have a nonprofit called uh, At the Winker's Mind Youth Fund uh, Foundation, and um, and it's a foundation that aims at putting fit zones in underprivileged areas to bring about you know fitness and just healthy 
healthy lifestyle. And so i done that the first two days of the weekend, but then I flew out. I was able to get an early flight out on uh, Sunday morning. Was it Saturday, Sunday morning or Saturday evening? And yeah, Saturday night, got back. And I think the first person I talked to, I think it was T. Good. It was actually Tavares Gooden, uh, part of the Tony Montana squad. And I mean, I, 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 tell, I tell people, man, my, my, my first four years, that, that weekend was a special weekend because my first four years in the league, uh, it was uh, it was tough. You know, going out there every weekend and you're just getting your head beat in just to, you know, get get a 500 record and, and then hope you get in with a losing record in seven and 79 or, or something like that it was back then or eight and eight and all that stuff. And but then all of a sudden, you know, 2011, 12, and 13, man, those were some tremendous years. I was just feeling what it was like to win, and not just what it was like to win, but to win with those guys and Tavares Good. You know, a lot of those guys who were back um, from that 2012 uh, year, uh, it was just, man, I, if you could have just felt the energy that it felt like um, inside the locker room, the way we practiced, the way we hung out, the way we we yeah just the way we did everything and so again that weekend was just a, was a special weekend to see everybody come back well most everyone and everybody that wasn't able to come back you were missed as well and, uh, and to those who are no longer with us you know shout out Paris Harrison um, you know RIP to him uh, yeah it was just a special weekend and Jim Harbaugh was back for the first time too did you get to talk with Jim Oh man, old coach! <laughs> I did, I did. We uh, what was interesting was um, <clears throat> on the way over to the game. We always on the way over to the game. We had this. It was it had this feeling of like I was sitting in where I would usually sit at. Navarro was sitting where he would usually sit at, <laughs> and and I just looked and and Harbaugh was sitting right there in front of us, and it was just one of those like moments where you just look at the triangle and you're like, wow, man, we we really did. Uh, have something special and we did some special things here. Unfortunately, we didn't do the the thing that would have just made it all just, you know, it, <laughs> it was winning that Super Bowl. But um, you know, it was it was a good time though. If the rest would have thrown that damn holding flag at the end of the game, maybe it would have been different, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Patrick. I really appreciate the time. Again, the website is huddleupobesity.org. You can go and check it out and get some good strategies for some uh, healthy living, which, let's be honest, we could all probably be in a little bit better shape. So thanks again for the time, Patrick. Hope we can do it again soon. Hey, Rob. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Back here on the Gold Standard Podcast Network. All right, Levin. That was interesting from Patrick Willis. He kind of seemed to be more on the Lance side of things, which is interesting because I feel like a lot of people are on Team Purdy. He seemed to kind of be on Team Trey just because of what they had invested in him. Uh, and you know what? I'm I'm proud to say I'm on the same side as Patrick Willis. Uh, yeah, and it, it's interesting because, you know, during the Patrick Willis years, that Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick situation, there was always articles talking about you don't lose your starting gig due to injury. And that was kind of a refrain we saw in the media coming out that you don't lose your job due to, due to injury. And then Alex Smith did lose his job due to injury. Mm -hmm. And there, I remember there being reports at the time that some players weren't happy with that. Well, I think we know one of those players. I, I, I don't necessarily agree. I don't think somebody should, lose it just because of injury. But if somebody comes in and is better than that person was when they were healthy, yeah, you don't go back to the worst player just because. Right. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with that. Um, but I just thought that was interesting because a lot of people seem to be on team Purdy or Joe Montana apparently is on team Garoppolo, which we don't need to be asking Joe Montana you know, his opinion about anything else. Yeah. Joe, I I'm out. Like, I, I don't really care what Joe says anymore. He was going to pick Jimmy Garoppolo because he, he was Jimmy Garoppolo. He is the old guy yelling at you to get off his lawn. <laughs> he, he's the pastor. Like I, I'm done with what he thinks of the quarterback situation because it's the same thing every time. You know, and the fact that he threw the, the dig in there at Steve Young at the end of that quote, I don't know if you saw it or if any of our people watching or listening saw it, but he said that. Uh, you know, Brock was handed a really good team or a team that was ready to win or something, something along those lines, like another guy I know. And he's hinting at Steve Young. It's like, right. get out of here, Joe. It's been 30 years. Move the heck on. If that's your attitude, I don't 
care to see you around at anything anymore. Like <laughs> my respect for Joe Montana has gone down a lot. And like the last 10 years, like I get it when it was like fresh and new, but it's been 30 years, like move on. Got a little bit of breaking news here. 11. I'm just seeing this now on Twitter. Ian Rappaport says Brock Purdy will meet with Dr. Keith Meister in Dallas on February 21st and plans to have surgery to repair his torn UCL on the 22nd, sources say. The surgery, said to be done by the respected Rangers doctor, will allow Purdy to make a full recovery and be ready for training camp. See see that last? Yeah, line? you can't know that. That's from an agent. That's from Brock's agent and his people or Team Brock because there's no way to freaking know that. They don't even know for sure what surgery he's going to have till they open him up. So forget right. that last part. Right. The only question that they've been able to look at and analyze, and I'm talking about the doctors here, to come to a conclusion is surgery or no surgery. Because it's possible it could heal on its own if it wasn't a, a major tear. So they had to decide whether he needs surgery or not. The question of whether or not he needs a repair or a reconstruction is something they will not know whatsoever until nope. he's opened up. Right, because they so can... anybody saying, "Hey, he's having surgery and he's going to be ready by training camp," is just lying through their teeth. And quite honestly, uh, it, it's something a journalist shouldn't be putting out there. A journalist is supposed to correct these things because you know, like even me as a small time journalist back in my day covering high school sports, coaches and athletic directors would say certain things that you knew weren't one hundred percent true, and they're glossing over the real facts. So you had to do your job and correct those things in your article that you don't include that part of it. And you say, they think he'll be back for six months, but this is a possibility as well. Something right. along those lines. And I know that everybody wants to just believe that he, everything's going to be fine, but I we certainly don't hope know. so. Right. Of course I want, I don't want anybody to have any complications from their surgery. I hope Brock has a perfect surgery and he comes back hundred percent healthy. Hell, I hope he comes back stronger than before, but we just don't know is, um, is my only point. We don't know right. what surgery he's going to have. We don't know how he's going to heal, how the recovery process is going to go. If he has to deal with infection, which, by the way, happens all the time with NFL players yeah. and injury. Like, we just don't know and we won't know until the time comes. And I know we don't do well with that as fans. We like to say immediately what's going to happen and he's going to be back and everything's going to be fine. We don't know but he's not going to have surgery until the 22nd, Levin. So we were just right. talking about that earlier in this show. That's basically the end of the month. Yeah, so I just looked. The Niners had one preseason game after the 22nd because six months from now is August 22nd, or six months from the surgery date is August 22nd. The Niners played on the 20th and the 25th. Now, if you remember, they had that super long layoff that the yeah, team was upset about. layoff. So it is possible they could have two out of the three preseason games when he's a full go. But, I mean, that, that six-month timetable is also, it can get adjusted a week or two yes. either side because, uh, like we've talked about before, it's three months until he's able to start training and rebuilding the strength and getting everything up to, up to par. Everybody's different. Some players, hey, he might be ready to go at training camp. If there's somebody that heals super fast, you know, if their name's Adrian Peterson with his ACL, like maybe he's one of those people. Uh, some people are the opposite. It might be he's not ready during the season at all. Some, I don't, I, I hate to say it, but there have been, obviously pitchers are the comparison here. There have been quite a few pitchers that have gotten this surgery, come back, thought they were fully healthy, start ramping up their program, and oh, something's wrong, and they have to go have the surgery again. So, like, the, the timetable, we're never going to know. We will not know with confidence. People will probably put a timetable out there and say, this is what it's going to be. We won't know the actual timetable, I think, until he's about a month into throwing. Like, at the start of training camp, when players report, we'll be able to probably get some concrete idea of when he'll be back. Until then, it's all speculation. Right. This is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the Brock Purdy saga that we will go along with. It's the beginning um, of the legendary journey. The legendary journey, which you can see on the YouTube page, <laughs> youtube.com slash at stats on fire. By the way, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button on the YouTube page. Please, please, please. Uh, we're going to be with you throughout the entire off season. So there'll be plenty of good content coming your way. The last thing I want to get to you, uh, to you, get to with you, Levin, as I, have trouble talking here. Sorry, I'm battling a cold. Steve Wilkes hired as defensive coordinator. The biggest difference 
that I see between his scheme and the scheme that D'Amico Ryans ran is that D'Amico was in two high safeties a lot of the time, and Steve Wilkes was in one high safety a lot of the time. Now, it doesn't mean that Wilkes can't modify his system, but let's just say for the sake of argument right now that they are in one high safety a lot of the time. The good part of that is it puts Talanoa Hufanga closer to the line of scrimmage, which I think is the best way to use him. The bad part about that is it kind of puts a lot more responsibility and stress on your cornerbacks, and that's not necessarily the strength of this 49ers defense. Yeah, so one interesting thing that I want to see is Wilkes is known as a highly aggressive uh, defensive coordinator. He blitzes a lot. Uh, I think I don't know the numbers for this past year, but the three previous years that he's been an NFL defensive coordinator, his team was in the top four for blitz percentage, blitz rate. Uh, And then you also have, uh, I looked back, there was an article uh, comparing him to his predecessor. You know, his first chance in the NFL as a defensive coordinator was in Carolina after Sean McDermott left for Buffalo. So I always think it's interesting to see what a guy who's taking over for an already established regime, what changes, especially when there's a a, a head coach that's that same side, you know, Ron Rivera's defensive. So what happened was the previous high in the years that Sean McDermott was the DC in Carolina was 26% blitz. The first year with Wilkes, which was the only year before he went to care or to Arizona, he blitzed 43%. So almost doubled it. That shows you that like that, that's him. You know, that's not, oh, our per, you know, he's to a new team and this fits the personnel better. That's him taking the same team and just raising the blitz percentage uh, to an extreme degree. So I would expect a lot more exotic blitzes, things like that. Now, the 49ers did start blitzing more under D'Amico Ryans uh, than especially than with Sala. I think Ryan started blitzing more and more as he progressed. It seemed like that became more and more of a thing. So I don't think it's going to be too extremely different. But it will be interesting to see how he likes to blitz, who he blitzes, and things like that. So this past year, once Wilkes took over as interim head coach of the Panthers, he had the sixth highest blitz rate of anybody. D'Amico Ryans was at 18th, by the way. Um, So, yeah, hopefully he blitzes more. I know Brian Burns from the Panthers talked about once Wilkes got in there, he blitzed me a lot more. I wasn't dropping into coverage as much. And so maybe that means Fred Warner will blitz a lot more. That'd be interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing that, even though Fred is really good in coverage. Here's the thing, Levin, and there's a good article about this in The Athletic from David Lombardi and Matt Barrows. They do this awesome breakdown in the offseason every year. They go through every single unit on the 49ers, and they just have like a full breakdown of them. And what they pointed out in the secondary portion of that is the Niners pass rush really kind of fell off towards the end of the year. It really faltered and the secondary kind of picked up the slack. Um, So they're going to need more of a consistent pass rush all year wrong, AKA Drake Jackson, not hitting the rookie wall would be good. Um, But the secondary picked that up. So if you're going to blitz more, you're going to have to rely more on your secondary. Yeah. And he, he has a secondary background. Uh, I do think there's there's two more interesting points about Wilkes. Uh, one, he's the most experienced de- defensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan's had in San Francisco. Yep. I think that's been kind of glossed over that the previous two, their first time being defensive coordinators was with Kyle Shanahan. They had to learn on the job. Wilkes is not only an experienced defensive coordinator. I mean, he has three plus years as a defensive coordinator because he had interim head coaching jobs, but like early in his career, he had at smaller schools in college, he was the defensive coordinator. And then he also has the year in 2021 when he came back to coaching after a year off uh, where he was the defensive coordinator at the University of Missouri. So he's a lot more experienced. I think it'll be interesting interesting to see if Kyle Shanahan kind of lets him be a little bit more. I, I, I don't know how to put it. You know, we've heard pretty much been confirmed by players that Kyle Shanahan has a heavy hand in the defense, even on game days. Maybe Kyle doesn't need to do that as much because he literally has somebody that not only is a defensive coordinator that's experienced, but a head coach. And he's able to concentrate more on the offense and not have to go over to the defense when the defense is on the field. Not that he'll completely be hands off, but I think that would be an interesting thing to sit and watch. I hope that he does um, because there's only so much time in a day. You can only focus 100% of yourself on so many different things. And let's be honest, 
the Niners need Kyle to focus 100% on the offense. Let your guys run the ship. And uh, I, I think that he will. Uh, I like that there's another head coach on the staff. I was saying this to Steph. You know, he was the head coach of Arizona for a year. Also the interim head coach of the Panthers. I think that's good. You need someone else. Kyle needs someone else that sort of understands what it's like to go through the fire. Like none, yeah. the staff has turned over so much in the past couple of years. He's lost a lot of his key advisors. I think that was part of the reason why you saw Bobby Turner come back this year, like way earlier than he I mean, was. You also have to come Anthony back. Lynn. Like it seems like Kyle values that. Yeah, but Anthony Lynn might, he's got interested in terms of uh, being a coordinator this year. So he might be gone. Right. So you're going to need that. Um, but I do like the Wilkes hire. I think it's a good hire. Um, and hopefully he stays for a couple of years. Although with the way 49ers defensive coordinators have been getting hired, who knows? Uh, but we'll find out anyway. That's I, I do be- think it's, uh, it might end up being the best possible scenario. Cause the thing that's been glossed over with Vic Fangio, you know, everybody thinks he was the best candidate. Vic Fangio is well-established. He is definitely somebody that's in a very aggressive, uh, personality. He might not have wanted Kyle Shanahan weighing in and coming to game days. You know, I could I could see those two butting heads on game days and it not going as well as everybody thought. So Wilkes might literally be the best option that existed for that position. And at worst, do you feel like the 49ers got the second best guy that was available, which is not a bad place to be? Uh, and I don't know that Wilkes is necessarily, but I'm saying even in like the worst case scenario, right? You ended up with the second best candidate on the market. That's still pretty damn good. And uh, clearly he's going to have a lot to work with, with first team all pros at every single level of the defense. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. Again, rate, review, follow the Niners. uh, Let's try that again. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. Rate, review, and follow the Gold Standard Podcast Network. It's still breaking those bad habits. Uh, We do appreciate all your support, all the reviews that have come in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button on the YouTube page as well. Levin, have a spectacular week. Enjoy more 49ers chatter from Radio Row this week. Yeah. Love the Super Bowl.